Only moderators can be heard. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. It's good to hear that everyone is in great spirits this morning. We pray that you are in good health also. The psalmist says in Psalms 121, verses 1 through 8, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forever. Once again, good morning. We have the announcements for today. Continue to pray for Sister Jill King on the recent loss of her niece to COVID-19. Sister Julia Hicks has tested positive, positive for the virus, yet symptom-free and grateful for the prayers. Continue to pray for Sister Gail Evans' daughter, Wanda Porter, home from the hospital, recovering from pneumonia. Sister Vonsell Hill is out of rehab and home with her son. Sister Constance Williams, also home from rehab after a bout with pneumonia. John Henry Continue praying for all of our, us dealing with health concerns. Continue to pray for all of our sick and shut in and they are caregivers, and all of us grieving the loss of loved ones. As Brother McLean mentioned, Sister McLean is in the hospital, not uh, with the virus, but she has a recurrent illness. Continue to pray for her. On our roster this morning, we have Brother Greg Shields will be our song leader, meditation and scripture, Brother Donald Nelson. Our sermon will be given by Brother Terrence McLean and communion by Brother Rick Winston. I'm Brother Frank Barnes and you have been called to worship. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, it's once again we bow before your throne of grace and mercy thanking you for allowing us to see another Lord's Day. We pray, Father, for our continued health, that you continue to watch over us. Now, as we worship you in spirit and in truth, we pray that you will allow your manservant to deliver your message without any addition or subtraction. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's pick up a songbook and join in with Brother Greg. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Joey. All right. Um, let's tell the world how awesome, awesome our God is. <clears throat> My God is awesome, he can move mountains, keep me in the valley, hide me from the rain. My God is awesome, heals me when I'm broken, strength where I've been weak, forever he will reign. My God is awesome, yeah, awesome, well, awesome, awesome, my God is awesome, he can move mountains, keep me in the valley, 
hide me from the rain. My God is awesome, heals me when I'm broken, strength where I've been weakened, forever he will reign. Our God is awesome. Today's meditation from First Timothy, second chapter, verses one through six. First Timothy, second chapter, verses one through six. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be tested in due time, not written in this book. God bless those who read his word. Our scripture reading for this morning is from Isaiah, the fourth chap, 40th chapter, Isaiah 40. And I'll be reading 27 through, verses 27 through 31. The King, from the King James Version of the Holy Scriptures. Isaiah 40, verses 27 through 31. Why sayest thou, o, o Jacob, and speaketh, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall literally fail. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings and eagles, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. God bless the reading of the hearers of his holy scriptures. Let us now go to God in prayer. God, our Father in heaven, we approach your mighty throne of grace this day. Thanking you, Lord, for having pardoned us and guided and directed us through the past days of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for watching over us and keeping us and protecting us in these days of, of, of medical concerns, in these days of sinful concerns, in these days of weakness, in these days of disenchantedness. We thank you, God, for being our God. We thank you, God, for your protection. We thank you, God, for your family, the University Church of Christ, your family, the churches of Christ throughout the land and country. Thank you, Lord, for having joined us to this family, having joined us to this body, and having enabled us to worship together and praise together one with the other. We just thank you, Lord, for watching over us and blessing those members of our family who are not well and who have, who have uh, confronted with illnesses. 
We pray a special prayer for Sister Von Seal Hill. We pray a special prayer for Sister Healing. Thank you, Lord, for blessing uh, Sister Owsley. Thank you, Lord, for blessing all those, all those ladies. We should not have started calling names because, God, you are God, and you are a blessed Heavenly Father. Once again, Lord, we pray that you will bless and watch over the Menorah Park Nursing Home, where our sisters are, are, are staying, are temporarily there, and we pray that you'll bless the establishment, bless the management there, bless the nurses there, bless the people who will be watching over and looking after our loved ones. Bless all your creation, Lord, throughout the land and country. You have made this earth, and you have made it in your good. Now, Lord, as we have come together today to worship and study your word, we thank you for Brother Terrence McLean. We thank you for having sent him our way and having endowed him with a message sent from heaven on high. Please, Lord, continue to bless Sister McLean. Bless her in a special way. Watch over her. Keep her safe. Bless the doctors. Bless the nurses. Bless the aides. Bless, bless all the first responders. Who, who wait and take care of Sister McLean, take, and, and who take care of all of our members who watch over the sick and the shut-in and those who are weak and those who, who are not able to, to come and worship to, to, together as we are. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your message of unity, Lord. And we just thank you for your word, which, which is uh, enables us to learn of you and study your word. Now, Lord, as we prepare to go into uh, our in-depth study, the scriptures, we just pray that you'll guide and lead us, direct us, and bless us this day. Amen. There are some things I may not know. There are some places I, I cannot go. But I am sure. This one thing is that my God is a for I can feel him in my soul. Don't you know God is real? He's so real in my soul. Oh yes, my God is a real. For he has and made me whole His love for me Is just like pure gold Oh yeah, my God is real For I can feel him in my soul don't you know God is real? You go, my my God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul. Amen. Yes, God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul. We are certainly grateful to God Almighty for blessing all of us with the opportunity 
to come together and to worship him uh, virtually in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic. We are again thankful uh, to our three elders who are here uh, with us uh, helping to conduct this service, Brother Frank Barnes, Brother Donald Nelson, Brother Greg Shields, thank you for not only being here, but for leading us in various aspects of, uh, of worship. Uh, we are thankful that Brother uh, Rick Winston is here. We appreciate so very much all that he does uh, for the body of Christ that meets in this place. Uh, again, I would like to say to the University Church of Christ family, uh, thank you for your cooperation in all that the shepherds have asked uh, us to do, uh, that we might have some connection one with another and we might worship God uh, as best we can in these challenging conditions. Uh, especially, I'd like to thank you for your continuous contribution uh, to the work of the Lord by way of the collection. You mail them in, you drop them off, uh, you make sure they may even come electronically, and we are so thankful for that. As you have heard, Sister McLean is not on Facebook or on the conference call. She is in the hospital, uh, was taken there by paramedics at about 5.45 yesterday morning, and we thank all of the shepherds for their prayers and all of the brethren and my preaching brethren who have been praying on her behalf as well as family members and just ask you to continue to lift her her in prayer. So this morning's message is, is not just for you. This message this morning is for me to get through uh, these difficult, these challenging times. I'd like to do something a little differently this morning. And you know when I say that, that usually means I'm going to sing a song that we don't normally sing. And I will be mindful uh, uh, of our time together. But there's a song that the Lord put on my heart. Uh, that has been resonating uh, in my spirit all morning long. It is well with my soul. If you have a songbook, it is hymn number uh, 280. But I'd like for you to join in and sing this hymn with me, and I will be mindful of, of the time uh, so that we are efficient in using the time that you are giving us via Facebook or the teleconference. But it is well with my soul. Hymn number 280. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea bellows roar, Lord, hasten 
the day when the faith shall be sought. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the much for joining in and singing that song of praise to our God. Our text comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 through 31. And reading it from the New King James Version, it says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait upon the Lord. Pray with me. Gracious and eternal Father, we thank you for this day. Our prayer is that as we prepare to bring a message from your word, that you would empower me, fill me with your Holy Spirit. May I humble myself before you, use me as an instrument in your hand. May you get glory. May Jesus be lifted up, that all might be drawn to him. May the saints of God be edified, built up in the most holy and precious faith. And may those who have not yet obeyed the gospel and have their hearts pricked by the preaching of your word, convicted of the need of the salvation that is in Christ and in him alone. Thank you for Jesus, your son. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for his death in our stead. And thank you for his resurrection, for our justification. And he's on your right hand, making intercession, even as we pray and as we worship. Father, our prayer is that you will use this message right, to change our lives. In his blessed name we pray and ask it all. Amen. They that wait upon the Lord. I, I attended the greatest high school in all of the world. Graduated in 1971 from Inkster High School. I am a Viking and always will be a Viking. And even at the age of a teenager, I had begun to think about walking with God and being served in service to God. And as a member of the track team, I will remember that as I approached the long jump, which was one of the events I participated in, that before I ran down the runway to get to the launching board, I would always quote to myself, Isaiah 40, verse 31, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But I have learned, of course, now in my more mature age that Isaiah 40, 31 had nothing to do with me flying off of that board trying to set a record in the long jump. But in reality, this is a text that strengthens us when things are difficult. It strengthens us when we 
feel like there's nowhere else for us to go. When you look at the entirety of the book of Isaiah, you see a contrast between the first part of the book and the second part, which begins here in chapter 40. The book appears to be written in two definable sections, chapters 1 through 39, appear to carry one emphasis, while chapters 40 through 66 carry a different emphasis. Paul Butler, in his volumes on Isaiah, says that the first part of the book is prophecies of judgment, and the second part is prophecies of peace. Matthew Henry prefaces chapter 40 of his commentary on Isaiah by noting that the first part of the book consisted of many burdens, while the second part consists of many blessings. The first part of the book chiefly prophesied of Israel's distress, while the second part of Israel's deliverance. Another commentator labels the first part of the book as prophetic condemnation and the second part as prophetic consolation. Therefore, a contrast exists between the first part of the book, chapters 1 through 39, and the second part of the book, chapters 40 through 66. In the first part, punishment is proclaimed. In the second part, peace proclaimed. In the first part, the sin of Israel. In the second part, the salvation of Israel. In the first part, the suffering that is to come. In the second part, the servant who is to come. In the first part, we have the complaint of Jehovah. And in the second part, we have the comfort of Jehovah. Chapter 39 ends with the prediction of the upcoming Babylonian captivity, and chapter 40 begins with the words, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. So in the first part of the book, God's people hear much woe from the Lord, but now they're going to hear about waiting on the Lord. The reason for the first part of the book is that Israel had not trusted in God. They had practiced iniquity, evil, and corruption according to chapter 1 and verse 4. They had practiced harlotry and rebellion according to chapter 1, verse 21 through 23. They had practiced soothsaying and idolatry according to chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. They have practiced the substitution of evil for good, darkness for light, and bitter for sweet, according to chapter 5 and verse number 20. They have practiced false pride and drunkenness, according to chapter 28 and verse number 1. But due to the fact that God has brought them destruction because of their corruption, ruin and regret due to their rebellion, and imprisonment due to their idolatry, heartaches due to their harlotry and irritation due to their iniquity and deadly damage due to their drunkenness, Israel is now in penitent mode and God promises to take her from the ruin of woe to the renewal of waiting. That's a sad commentary regarding God's people. It's a sad commentary for God's people when he's got to take such measures as he did for Israel in order to get them to be faithful servants to him. It's a sad commentary when God has to bring us through suffering to get us to service. When he's got to bring us through worry to get us to worship. When he's got to bring us through problems to get us on our knees to pray. When he's got to bring us through loss to get us to labor. When he's got to bring us through failures to get us to faith. But God will do that. Because God loves his people, he will sometimes chastise them with the rod of correction. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6 declare, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. It is the discipline of the Lord that will bring Israel back to the practice of waiting on the Lord. But you know, as you and I look at Israel this morning, none of us can pass judgment on her, for all of us have had our struggles of faith. All of us have had times when we've turned from the way. The truth be told, the names by which we refer to one another. You can call me Brother McLean. You can call me uh, Brother Terry. You can call me Brother Terrence. And those names do not reveal our aliases. 
It does not reveal our former name. Whatever name you are called by this morning does not speak to the fact that you've got an alias. Because if you are a Christian, you have a former name. All of us have an alias. All of us have an AKA, also known as A-L-L-R. Why is that? Because the indictment against us is found in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have had times when we did something that we should not have done and neglected to do what we should have done. All of us have faced times in our lives when we've had to deal with the struggle of faith. We got discouraged and we did not wait on the Lord. We became distraught and struggled to continue to trust in God. We fell into depression and despair over our dilemma and we struggled to keep our faith. I can't hear you because you're not physically present with me, but you might be quiet, but I know you've been there. I don't know when you were there, but I know that you've been there. Maybe you were there when your mother died. I, I don't know. Maybe you were there when you got laid off from the job, even as a result of COVID-19. I don't know. Maybe you were there when your child was sick. I don't know. Maybe you were there when you got those test results from the doctor. I don't know. Maybe you were there when your marriage was falling apart. I don't know. And maybe you were there when you were hurt by that person you thought you could trust. Maybe you were there when church troubles were menacing your ministry or brethren were beating down your efforts. I don't know. Maybe you were there when you were enduring some weeping that wasn't just for one night, but you were weeping night after night after night. I don't know when you were there. I don't know if you're there now, but I know you've been there. In the midst of this COVID-19, you might be there. I know I've been there. Yesterday was a roller coaster for me from going up and going down, not knowing what was going on with my wife, not being able to be in her presence because no visitors are allowed in the hospital because of COVID-19. I, I changed the message that I was going to preach to you today five times yesterday and then got up this morning, changed it again because I don't know what's going on, but I do know God. You see, you've been there when you had to struggle with your faith. When your fear was high and your faith was low, when your complaints were many and your companions were few, when your sadness was prevalent and your singing was silent, when your troubles were your focus and your trust was failing, when your woes were horrendous and your waiting was a hard thing to do. As a matter of fact, since I've been up here preaching this message, my phone has rung twice, and it's, I know it's the hospital phone line. I don't know what they want to talk to me about, but as soon as I finish this sermon, I'm going to call them back because I don't know what's going on. But during those times, we probably do the same things that I see Israel doing in this text. There are three things that we do when we try to get out from under our troubles and our trials and our burdens and the problems of our lives. Number one, we try wailing it out. Number two, we try working it out. And then we come to the best solution, and that is waiting, waiting it out. But McLean, what do you mean, wailing it out? We have God responding to Israel's wailing in Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 27. Times were hard for Israel. The northern kingdom had lost her war with Assyria. As a result, they were no longer the glorious kingdom they used to be. Many were exiled from their homeland and fleeing for their lives. The southern kingdom of Judah was going through a transition of successive kings. As a result, they were experiencing constant revolts, wars, chaos, and death. The present was populated with perplexity, and the future was filled with uncertainty. It is in the midst of this tragedy and trouble that the people are wailing and mourning. They say in verse number 27, My way is hidden from the Lord and my just claim is passed over by my God. In other words, they were saying or asking the question, Where is God? Where is the response of God? Where is God's grace in the midst of my grief? Where is God's deliverance in the midst of my dilemma? 
Where is God's hand in the midst of my horror? Where is God's answer in the midst of my anguish? Where is God's promise in the midst of my pain that I'm going through right now? Who, who among us does not wail and cry in the midst of our troubles? We do like Job did. In Job 30 and verse 16, he says, And now my soul is is poured out because of my plight. The days of affliction take hold of me. We are like the predictive passage regarding the suffering Savior in Psalm 22, verse 1 and 2, when Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season and am not silent. Yes, we're like Job and David. We, we have a tendency to ease our pains by weeping and welling it out. Our cry is, where are you, Lord? The doctor just used the word cancer. Where are you, Lord? The doctors are telling me as we talk on the phone, we don't know what's going on and we're still trying to figure out. We're going to run more tests. And, of course, the thought comes to my mind, where are you, Lord? The highway patrolman just rang the doorbell with bad news about an accident involving your child. Where are you, Lord? I, I just looked in the mailbox and there's a foreclosure notice there. Where are you, Lord? My marriage is on the rocks. My family is torn apart. My depression is getting worse. My day is getting darker. The crying spells are coming more often. And my question is, God, where are you? Even as I shaved on this morning, didn't understand what was going on, but, but I noticed there was tears running out my eyes down my cheeks, getting in the way of my magic shave. And I guess the question really is, God, I don't know what's going on. Can you give me some in insight as to what's happening now? Isaiah lets them know that the question has already been answered. The thing that we have to admire about these people is that although they were asking the wrong question, at least they were asking the right person. They were at least talking to God. Verse 28 shows the question had already been answered. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. In other words, don't you know who you're dealing with? Haven't you heard about the great things that God has done and the great things that God can do? That was the question. The answer comes in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 21 through 26. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth that same God, who laid the foundations of the earth, that same God who sits on the circle of the earth, that same God who stretched out the heavens like a curtain, that same God who brings the princes to nothing, that same God who created the stars, numbered them and called them each by name, that same God who has power and might and dominion, who never sleeps and whose ways are past finding out. You're asking questions that have already been answered. And if you know the answer, you're going to have to learn to wait on the Lord. But after welling it out, we try working it out. You see, sometimes we don't think that God is doing it right. Well, God's not moving fast enough. And so we try to work things out in our own might. You remember that Abraham and Sarah tried that way back in Genesis chapter 12. God told Abraham that he was going to make of him a great nation and that a blessing of the earth was going to come through his seed. But Abraham didn't wait on the Lord. He got in a hurry, and he tried to work it out himself. And in Genesis chapter 15, verses 2 and 3, he, he complained to God that he had no offspring and remained childless. So in Genesis chapter 16, we see Abraham and Sarah trying to work it out rather than to wait it out. They had a child through Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar, but that was not the child to promise. And it was 14 years later that God gave them Isaac, the son of promise. 
They had to learn to wait it out rather than to work it out by their own human understanding and power. So God says to Isaiah that the comfort that he will give will not come by human might, human power, or by human wisdom. In verse 29 and 30, he says he gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Sometimes we seek relief and comfort through our own wisdom and our own ways. There are even Christians who fall away from the faith, saying that they're trying to get some things worked out. When you try to talk to them, they say that they'll be back after they get it together and after they get things straight and after they get all these things worked out. But what they're doing is relying on human wisdom that leads them not toward God, but leads them away from God's way. And the fact is, they will. And if you're one of them, you will never get it worked out because you're depending on the wrong power. God says, I'm the power. I give power to the weak, and I'm the one that makes the mighty mighty. The most perfect specimen of human strength will sooner or later exhaust all his human resources. You can fight, but only so long under your own power. You can run, but only so far under your own power. You can lean on your own virility, but human strength will eventually fail. That's why Ephesians 6.10 exhorts us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his, his might. Quit trying to work it out on your own. Stop that. Stop trying to work it out by your own wisdom and not following God's direction. You're trying to do it on your own is mission impossible. Doing it on your own is an effort in futility. Doing it on your own is hopeless venture. Doing it on your own is wasted time and wasted effort. Because after wailing it out, followed by your attempts to work it out, eventually you got to come to waiting it out. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. To wait on the Lord means to hope and trust in God. It means to have an attitude of faith that will allow you to hold on until his purpose is fulfilled and his promise deliverance finally comes. For hope and trust in God will enable you to do some extraordinary things in the midst of your circumstances. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Trust in God will enable you to do some extraordinary things. For when you can be strong when your situation is weak, that's extraordinary. When you can sing praise when your situation is full of sorrow, that's extraordinary. When you can rejoice while you are in the midst of ruin, that's extraordinary. When you can look up when everything around you seems to be going down, that's extraordinary. When you can give thanks when you ain't got much or don't have nothing at all, that's extraordinary. When you can be renewed in your inner man day by day, though the outward man is perishing, that's extraordinary. While the rest of the world has lost its stability and its focus, while everyone is afraid and frightened about the coronavirus pandemic, you can have peace in your soul because of your relationship with God. That is extraordinary. But you have to wait on the Lord. Isaiah reminds them of who God is and what God has done. He's a God that never faints and he never gets weary. He never has an economic crisis. Some of you all are banking on that thousand dollars coming from the government. They just want you to spend it so business folk can make more money. But God never has an economic crisis. 
His resources are never lacking. His strength is stupendous. His might is monumental. His riches are uncountable. His wisdom is indescribable. His power is spectacular. His age is infinite. His purpose is unstoppable. Isaiah told them to remember who God is and what God has done. When you were down there in Egypt, God renewed your strength. When you were wandering in the wilderness, God renewed your strength. When you were conquering the promised land, God renewed your strength. When you were exhibiting your bipolar, manic, depressive cycle during the time of the judges, God renewed your strength. And while you endure your captivity in Babylon, just wait on the Lord and he'll renew your, your strength. You'll mount up with wings like eagles. You'll run and not be weary, and you'll walk and, and not faint. By this description, Isaiah may have had in mind the way that they would leave their captivity and return to their homeland, just as their forefathers did when they left Egypt. They mounted as an eagle and that God defeated the Egyptians who were slaving the Israelites and made the Egyptians bow down to the will of God and to the Hebrews they had enslaved. They ran from Egypt in that they left in haste, commemorated by the unleavened bread. They walked without fainting as they journeyed in the wilderness because God protected their strength and didn't even allow their shoes to wear out. Likewise, the day will come when they will leave Babylonian captivity. They will be lifted out of bondage as an eagle spreads its wings and lifts off from the ground. They would, in their excitement, make haste to return to their homeland. God would give them the strength to make that journey of hundreds of miles, and they would reconstruct the temple, rebuild the walls, restore the worship. Church, listen to me. We may be isolated and quarantined right now, but I, too, am looking for a time when we will be able to come back together and sing praises of God and to teach one another in psalm and hymns and spiritual songs and to edify each other and to lift up those who are burdened and to wipe the tears from one another and it will not be when we die and go to heaven. God is going to work it out sooner than we think. God would give them the opportunity to be restored in worship. He'll give us the opportunity to be restored in our assembly together. Those are the kinds of blessings that come to those that wait on the Lord. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. That is, in the midst of our struggles, we have to learn to take a God's eye view. Right now, we are not able to fly anywhere. Uh, you might not even be able to get a refund. Uh, in my old age, I'd rather fly than drive any time. Because when you are flying in the air, you see things from, from a different perspective. If you've ever been on one of man's great metal eagles called airplanes, you know that the view is different from the air than it is from the ground. On the ground, your sight is limited to what's immediately around you can't see over the next hill on the ground. You can't see what's ahead too far on the ground. You have no view of what's at the end of the road on the ground. But when you mount up like an eagle, you get a God's eye view of the territory. You can see what lies ahead from the air. You can see which way the road turns from the air. You can see the obstacles that are along the way from the air. You can see where the rest stops are located from the air. And you can see the lights from the city where you're headed from the air. So I want to say to you, as we continue through this pandemic and all of the other circumstances of life, when you're going through your troubles, you need to learn to take off on the wings of faith and see what's going on in your life from the air. You will see the triumph that will come out of your troubles from the air. You will see the patience that results from your problems from the air. You'll see the blessings that come from your burdens from the air. You will see the glory that will come from your grief 
from the air. And you will see how God will work all things together for your good when you see them from a God's eye view because you have mounted up with wings like an eagle and you see the situation from the air. But then there does come a time when you have to land. Those great metal eagles hit the runway. They're traveling at a rapid speed for a while. And, and once you've got a God's eye view from the air, you hit the ground running. You're not afraid anymore. So you're running to defeat your problems, not running away from them with the help of the Lord. That's what David did in 1 Samuel 17 when he faced the giant Goliath. David said in verse 45 and 46, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And the text says that David hurried and ran to meet that Philistine. He ran because the Lord was his strength. He ran because the Lord was his power. He ran because the Lord was his might. He ran because the Lord was with him and had given him the victory. I say to all of the members of the University Church of Christ and all other members of the body of Christ throughout this country, throughout this world, all of those who have obeyed from the heart the doctrine of Christ and are Christian and they're looking forward to going to heaven, I say to each and every one of you, you need to run, run, and the Lord will not allow you to be weary. Run and the Lord will help you to have the strength. Run and the Lord will help you to be empowered. Run and the Lord will make a way somehow. Run the race with patience as Hebrews 12 verse 1 says looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. And then finally after the plane flies it lands and speeds down the runway then it slows down to a steady pace until it docks at the terminal. God says that those who wait on him will walk and not faint. Therefore you need to walk with the Lord. You need to keep a steady pace until you reach your destination and that's the city that God has prepared for us. We call it heaven. You walk and don't give up. You walk and don't get discouraged. You walk and you don't despair. But remember what you saw while you were in the air. You were able to see the end of the road. You were able to see that there is a city. So while you walk, you've got to remember what you saw while you were in the air. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says that they look for a city whose foundation and maker is God. They hadn't seen the end of their faith, but they came. Kept on walking. Don't let the obstacles that you face while you walk make you forget the city you saw while you were in the air. Don't let the tears that you shed while you walk make you forget the city you saw when you were in the air. Don't let the burdens that you bear while you walk make you forget the city that you saw when you were in the air. Don't let the troubles that try you while you walk make you forget the city that you saw while you were in the air. Don't let the challenges that you confront while you walk make you forget the city you saw while you walked while you were in the air. Don't let the hurts that you suffer while you walk make you forget the city that you saw while you were in the air. And don't let the pains that you feel while you walk make you forget the city that you saw while you were in the air. Psalm 27 verse 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. For those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not, and not faint. Let me close. And we're going to go a little bit over an hour, and I hope you don't mind this morning. But let me close with, with something called push. P period, U period, S period, H period says, a man was sleeping at night in his cabin when suddenly his room filled with light and God appeared. The Lord told the man he had worked for him to do and showed him a large rock in front of his cabin. The Lord explained that the man was to push against the rock with all his might. So this man did, day after day. 
For many years he toiled from sun up to sun down, his shoulders set squarely against the cold, massive surface of the unmoving rock, pushing with all of his might. Each night the man returned to his cabin, sore and worn out, feeling that his whole day had been spent in vain. And since the man was showing discouragement, the adversary, Satan, decided to enter the picture by placing thoughts into the weary mind. You've been pushing against that rock for a long time, and it hasn't moved. Thus he gave the man the impression that the task was impossible and that he was a failure. These thoughts discouraged and disheartened the man. Satan said, why kill yourself over this? Just put in your time, giving just the minimum effort, and that will be good enough. And that's what the weary man planned to do. But he decided to make it a matter of prayer and to take his troubled thoughts to the Lord. Lord, he said, I've labored long and hard in your service, putting all my strength to do that which you have asked. Yet after all this time, I have not even budged that rock by half a millimeter. What's wrong? Why am I failing? The Lord responded compassionately, My friend, when I asked you to serve me and you accepted, I told you that your task was to push against the rock with all your strength, which you have done. Never once did I mention to you that I expected you to move it. Your task was to push. And now you come to me with your strength spent, thinking that you have failed, but is it really so? Look at yourself. Your arms are strong and muscled. Your back sinewy and brown. Your hands are callous from constant pressure. Your legs have become massive and hard through opposition. You have grown much and your abilities now surpass that which you used to have. True, you haven't moved the rock, but your calling was to be obedient and to push and to exercise your faith and trust in my wisdom. That you have done. Now I, my friend, will move the rock. At times when we hear a word from God, we tend to use our intellect to decipher what he wants, when actually what God wants is just simple obedience and faith in him. By all means, exercise the faith that moves mountains, but know that it is still God who moves mountains. When everything goes wrong, just push. When the job gets you down, just push. When people don't react the way you think they should, just push. When your money is gone and the bills are due, just push. When people just don't understand you, just push. Though it may seem hopeless right now in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of all of these unemployed folk, in the midst of our finances being taken away, but I want to remind you to keep on pushing. Pray until until something happens and God will move the mountain. And for those of you who are not Christians, you see, you need to do more than just pray. You need to obey God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent his apostles out with all power, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15 and 16, and then in Acts chapter 2, the first gospel message was proclaimed about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you want to get in a position to pray until something happens, you need to be a member of the body of Christ, the church of Christ, the church of our Lord. You need to simply be a Christian. Hear the truth. Hear how Jesus lived, died, and was buried, and rose again the third day according to the Scripture. Believe that with all of your heart, because Jesus said in John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins, and where I am, you cannot come. And when you believe that he's gone back to heaven and that one day he's coming back again, when you believe that he's the head of the church that he bought with his own blood, when you believe that the church is powered by the Holy Spirit that he sent on the first Pentecost following his resurrection, when you believe that God is truly sovereign and in charge and are willing to be ruled by him in his kingdom, then repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then, yes, you must confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is God's Son. Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. And then, yes, you must be. It's not optional. You must be 
baptized, buried, covered up in water for the remission of your sins. Why? Because Jesus said so in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Why? Because Jesus said so in Mark 16, 15, and 16. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had Peter say so in Acts 2, 38. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had Ananias tell Saul of Tarsus, arise and be baptized, every one of you in the name, uh, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Why? Because Paul wrote the Galatians in Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as has been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Why? Because Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3.21. Wherefore baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. And when you come up out of the water. Your Holy, the Holy Spirit is put in your life. And you just keep waiting on the Lord. You can stop willing. You can stop trying to work it out. Just trust that one day God will take you safely and that he which has begun a good work in you will complete it or perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 and verse 6. My prayer is that you would allow us to help serve you if you're not a child of God. And for all of you who are Christians, remember God loves you. Jesus died for you. All of you who are Christians, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. And for all of you, whether you're Christian or not, remember God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you. And I am your servant for Jesus' sake. Again, we thank Brother McLean for such an outstanding, outstanding message on, the, on this morning. We turn our thoughts now to the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of uh, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we uh, commune uh, with him at this at this time why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go why did he choose the lowly bird because he loved me so he loved me so he Precious life for me, for me, because he loved, he loved me so. This morning as we commemorate the Lord's death, his burial, and his resurrection, let us look at Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 6, 7, and 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For, scarce, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure, for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let us pray and let us give thanks for this precious gift that God has given us. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we are thankful as your children that you have paved the way that we could be saved by giving your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. We remember, dear Lord, his body that he sacrificed for us and that was broken on Calvary, which is represented this morning in the bread that we take and that we eat. We also remember the Lord 
uh, dear Lord, how he shed his blood on Calvary to wash and to cleanse all of our sins away, which we take this morning, the fruit of the vine that represents his blood. Thank you, dear Lord, for loving us so much that you have paved the way that we can be saved. These prayers we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Because he lives, I confess tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives We have now reached the time in our service where we have an opportunity to give back to the Lord a portion of what he has given us. I'd like to remind the congregation that God is pleased at your giving. The Bible tells us in Luke, the sixth chapter, verses 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you yet for another opportunity to give unto your treasure not only to help this congregation to help your that your will will be done but to help others that are less fortunate than we are and as we remember the cross remember the greatest gift of all your son Jesus Christ let us be cheerful givers as we give into your treasury this is our prayer in your son Jesus name amen Please join me now in the benediction. Heavenly Father, we go into this week, as always, waiting on you. Father, we do not wait on the president. We wait on Jehovah. Father, we do not wait on the governor. We wait on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, there's something about the name of Jesus, Father. And as we go into this week, we pray that you continue to bless us, continue to bless those who are in need of health problems, that you will help them to recover. Continue to bless and watch over our sick and shed in. Continue to bless and watch over those who are bereaved at the loss of loved ones. Father, we wait on you because we have nowhere else to turn, and we know that the victory is already won. We just have to wait to be patient, continue to pray, and continue to have faith. Continue to watch over your manservant who delivered a powerful, powerful message today. We pray that you continue to 
bless him, give him good health. And Father, we pray a special pray, prayer for those who have not been added to your body, those who have not obeyed your gospel, that they truly receive the message, that they know what they must do. And when we reconvene together, that they will join us and obey the gospel. This is our prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen.